Welcome to Gutterfront. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you so much for tuning in. My very special guest today is Mary Arnold. She is a co-founder of Run for All Women and a co-leader of the November Project, the New York City Tribe. I met Mary almost 10 years ago when she was the first manager for Jack Rabbits at the Upper West Side Store at 86 and Lex. Wow, what a great store. Sadly, the store closed recently. So I am thrilled to have Mary as a guest. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here. Mary, I'll never forget that weekend, the first weekend at a new store, mm -hmm. had that all the sneakers were new, it smelled just wonderful, and you were the first manager there. So how was that, that first weekend like? That weekend was almost a blur of activity. I don't think anybody slept for a couple of days leading up to open. Uh, we had the entire staff working all day long to unpack boxes, to set the store, and then all of a sudden it was time to open and nobody really knew what to do. And it was already noontime, so we weren't sure if people would know we were open. And one of our staffers walked to the front of the store and he peeled off a newspaper article that had, we had printed and screened to the front of the store and he just pulled it down and walked away with it over his head and then we were open. Excellent. Yeah, Lee Silverman was ahead of his time opening up these stores. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if you heard his story. You know, he was on his honeymoon or someplace with his wife and he couldn't climb this mountain. Mm -hmm. And so he decided he needed to get fit. And so that's inspired him to uh, open up his first store. That's awesome. That's awesome. Great. Well, before we go further ado, let's introduce you to our audience, Mary. Tell us where you were born and something about your growing up years. So I hail from Western Massachusetts, born and raised. Um, I, didn't, I didn't participate in a lot of team sports as a child because I was the tallest kid in my class almost instantly. And being 5'7", by the time you're nine, kind of makes it a challenge to participate and be coordinated. Um, but I, I fell into running in high school. I had some friends that were on a track and field team, and we decided that we would, we would run. And I remember those first few laps around a cinder track on a pretty spring afternoon and thinking, hey, I, I can do this. This is, this is pretty great. Um, but all too soon, it was the end of high school. And college beckoned in Boston, and I got very into filmmaking and the art scene, and fitness kind of fell by the wayside. At a certain point, somewhere about three months after I graduated college, I was walking up the stairs to my second floor apartment and had to stop to breathe. Wow. And it was at that point that I realized I was 200 pounds. Oh, you had your Lee Zimmerman moment. Exactly, exactly. And I thought, well, I really have to do something about this. And I lived in the North End, which is a fabulous neighborhood, but everybody knows everybody. And, and people had just kind of gotten used to being me being the fun, artsy kid on the block. So they were really surprised when I took off running the next morning around the block as, as fast we all as do when we first As we all do when we first start running, right? The, the goal is to just sprint. And I came back around the block, completely red faced, totally gassed, hands on knees. And I thought, well, maybe tomorrow I can make two blocks. And I just kept trying and trying and trying. And I think it was probably a week before I realized you didn't have to run as fast as you could possibly run. And it was, it was springtime and it was just around the Boston Marathon. And I was always conscious of the Boston Marathon, watched it on TV as a kid, attended as a kid. And I, I couldn't believe it. Like there were all these different body types, all these different people, shapes, sizes, ages, everything. And I thought, someday I'm gonna do that. I crossed the finish line for the first time in April of 2003. So which school in Boston did you go to? I went to Emerson, film and screenwriting, yes. Excellent, excellent. So we're here in Manhattan Neighborhood Network, so some of this must be familiar very to you. Very much so. I, the control room looks really familiar, actually. It was very, um, very peaceful. It's like, I think I've cut projects in here before. Great college like that, you had you know, state-of-the-art software and hardware. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because we did but there, there, there needed to be a, a sort of a break-even point when you have incoming freshmen and you have all this new technology that keeps changing and changing. At some point, they have to make a decision and say, okay, you guys are gonna use the old equipment and then we're gonna teach all of the younger kids how to use the newer equipment rather than try to teach the older kids all the new stuff too. So I was the last graduating class from Emerson that cut their final projects on film. 
So I physically used a Steenbeck with a sound head, with a splicer, and manually cut a seven-minute project and wow. held together with tape. Years later, when I was at an exhibit at the Museum of the Moving Image, was the Steenbeck. That, I, that was the model that I used to cut my senior project. And I thought, OK, so tech, is, tech has come away <laughs> since then. And now people could do films on iPhones, and they do. If I had another pass at film school, I think I'd be a wizard with iPhone and I, iMovies. The rise of technology, the, you know, some people call it a selfie culture, I think actually helped fuel the running boom that we see now. Because you have people taking sole selfies with their brand new running shoes, run selfies, here we are at races, and that actually fuels not only a culture of accountability but excitement around races. And that's one of the things that working with Run for All Women and with November Project we found to be so helpful. Even, you know, 30 second videos of what we're doing at a workout. Yesterday we had a workout where we did burpee broad jumps, which are a really difficult exercise that my tribe really hates when I say, hey, it's 20 burpee broad jumps, we're doing this. The video that we posted of the burpee broad jumps was viewed 400 times in an hour. <laughs> Having the capability in your phone to do these things fuels more interest in the things that, other things that we're passionate about. Okay, mm -hmm. so what was the next step in, in your in your discovery, self-discovery as a, as a long distance runner? Um, I found out they gave you free beer at the end of races, which was really cool when you're coming out of college and you don't have a lot of money, but beer is still like a really fun thing to spend your money on. And I very distinctly remember going to a run called the City Run, which was, I believe, started and ended in the Burren. Uh, which was this great Irish bar in, in Cambridge. And when you got to the finish, it was like free beers for everybody. And I thought, well, this is great. I paid $12 to do this and they gave me a t-shirt and I got to run a race and now I have, be this is great. So the first year running, it was uh, it was really about how many bars could I go to that had a race attached to oh. them. And after about a year, I realized, you know, if I slow down on the beer and run some more, I'm actually happier. And it was at that point that I, I realized I, I could probably do a half marathon. And I did the Bay State Half Marathon in Lowell, Massachusetts. And I remember so distinctly, there was a group from the Boston area called the L Street Runners, who were the probably the toughest bunch of people that were not actually a motorcycle gang that I'd ever seen. Um, they're just very southy, just really tough old like dock workers and, and electrical guys and all this stuff. And they had a sign right by the finish that said, pain is temporary, pride is forever, which is sort of a hallmark of races, but I'd never seen it before. And it was so impactful to me um, that I was just on cloud nine for the whole rest of the day. And it was at that point that I thought, well, how much longer can I go? And I started, you know, been testing my limits ever since. You're now a long distance runner. So obviously you went from the, the that 10K mm -hmm. beer crawl. That's a, I mean. That's basically <laughs> what they are, that's fair. So what was the, the next big step after that? So I, I made it to the, the first marathon and I am, just very honestly, unabashedly gonna say, I lined up at the back of the Boston Marathon, as many people did years ago. I'm not proud of it, but I am proud that I did finish and not die, which I kind of thought was gonna happen, considering I was extremely hyponatremic. I found out after the race that you're not supposed to drink 12 ounces of water at every single uh, aid station. Could be very dangerous. It could be, and that's what my physicians told me. And it was several days later that I was starting to feel better, and I thought, okay, I have to do this right. I did one and I lived, but that's not enough. Like, I have to do this right. And I remember looking at my computer and seeing that the New York City Marathon had just opened for lottery. And I put my ticket in, and a week later I found out I got in, and I ran the 2004 New York City Marathon roughly an hour and 45 minutes faster than I had finished the Boston. But, but did you train for this one? Did you? Oh, I did. I did, did you join a club or did I you I did. Program? I joined a, a wonderful group of folks in Massachusetts called the Empire One Running Club. They're still up in, and in business today. And then uh, just about two months after finishing the New York City Marathon, uh, I was at a potluck afternoon with the club. We had all gone out for a run on a snowy, icy day. And in the way that you know everybody when you know your running club, you're walking around the kitchen, you're not, hey, Bob, hey, Steve, hey, Jim. And then there was this one gentleman in the middle of the kitchen that I didn't know. And it shocked me because I, I thought, I don't know this guy. And I said, hi, person I don't know. <laughs> Can I get you a beer? I'm going to the kitchen. And he went, yeah, sure, I'll have a bass. Um, and that man is my husband.
I thought you bet. We started dating two weeks later and we just celebrated our 10th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. So running really has pretty much given me everything. That's a wonderful story. You bonded over a bass. Uh, yep, indeed, indeed. And uh, he's a very talented runner in his own right. And we used to go out on long training runs. And he, he stuck with me pretty much through marathons. And then when I started to do ultras, he was like, I, I don't know, I think I'll stay here. Uh, but he's been amazingly supportive and it's been a great run. So at some point you moved into the city. Mm -hmm. So New York City Marathon was September was November 2003. And then in August of 04, we came here. We had an opportunity. We were both teachers. I'm, I taught public high school for about eight years. Still and do? No, no. I left to pursue an opportunity in running, which oh, was okay. the store. I actually, when I opened Jackrabbit Lexington Avenue, I had recently left teaching. And I left it to do that because I thought I'm really passionate about this. How about we get recruited for those jobs at, um, at Jackrabbit in those early days? In those early days, it was a, it was a volunteer call. Um, Doug Oldegis, who's still with the organization, he's a wonderful guy. He knows more coaches in New York City than anybody you can imagine. I bumped into him at the New York City Expo in 04, so we had just moved, and we were talking, and, and he said, uh, we really could use a female coach. We only have guys, and we only have a, a very few, and we really could use more coaches. So I thought, oh, light bulb. So over that winter break from school, I took a coaching certification class, got certified, coached part-time from 2004 to 2008 when I uh, we announced the store, and I remember very distinctly Lee said to me, um, I'm opening a store uptown. I said, oh, that's great. Do you need me to coach out of there? And he said, I kind of want you to run the store. So I took I took the job, and uh, and I managed that store for several years, and it was a huge learning curve. But, I bet. But it was so much fun. Yeah, and, so it opened in 2008 then? Uh, we, we started build the build out in December of 2008 and we opened in March of 2009, right in the middle of the financial crisis. So it was a very <laughs> interesting time. I think you rose to the ranks because when I saw you last, mm -hmm. it was at the Columbus Circle. Yep. I came to visit uh, Niles to give mm -hmm. him his Run Eddie Voice yep, shirt that exactly. he special ordered. You took our photo. So, uh, there were some interesting twists and turns. Um, the I actually uh, worked uh, with Matt Wilpers at Asphalt Green for a little bit. I, I was training for my first 100 miler. So I took a little a little break for like two months to kind of get my head right and, and get myself into that because I'd never taken on anything like that before. And I was a very successful event for me. And then I was at an ultra when a gentleman named Jim Browning, and it turns out that he worked for a group called Running Specialty Group, uh, which was the parent company at the time of the Columbus Circle Store New York Running Company, which is now New York Running Company by Jack Rabbit. So I went to work with them and uh, was promoted really steadily. I just, I started at the store and within two weeks, somebody said, hey, we're supposed to do this event with Nike and nobody planned it. I said, how'd that happen? They said, it's not important. Can you help? And I said, okay, that's fine. So we put together this event with Nike and it went really well. And the VP of marketing called me and she said, I really need you to think about what you want to do could because we could use the help. And mm -hmm. I said, that sounds great. I'll do that. So um, promoted through managing uh, all of the community marketing for the New York stores, the New York and Connecticut, the New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts. And then ultimately when you and I had seen each other last time, I was the national marketing manager in charge of community engagement for all 64 of the wow. stores across the country. Wow, what a great story. It was, it was pretty cool. Going from a 200 pound kick walk up to the stairs mm -hmm. to running a whole region of the country. Yeah. Uh, and this is within a span like under 15 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you said you ran your first 100. Which one was that? The Leadville 100. Oh, you, you picked an iconic one. I, and you know, honestly, I didn't pick it for any other reason other than I have dear friends that live in Colorado, not too far from the race. And they said, you should come do this one. You could stay with us. And I said, oh, that sounds great. And somebody right before I left gave me a copy of Born to Run, which I hadn't read at the time. And I'm reading it on the plane thinking, oh my, I have really overshot the runway. I don't know when I'm going to do this. And I didn't sleep the night before, totally terrified, a crew of six people with me, and somehow we made it work. I finished that in 29, 45, 46. Oh, okay. The cutoff on that one is 30 hours. Oh, just but, made it, huh? Well, just, well, you know, seconds count or they wouldn't count them. Um, I distinctly remember my pacer uh, coming out of fish hatchery. We, you're on this long dirt stretch and you can just see for miles. 
and there were all these headlamps behind us. And he said, listen, you're, you're going to have to run a little faster. And I said, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm working on it. You know, this is what I can do at this point. And he said, no, 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 look at those lamps. You see those? And I said, yep. He said, they're not going to make it. They're going to sit them down at Fish Hatchery. I'll move faster. Okay, okay. What a um, motivation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. Um, sun came up just over Sugarloaf Pass, and I wasn't sure what time the final time cutoff was because at Leadville, the last cutoff is at 87 miles. So you could literally go 87 miles and then and you that, could that, say, we're sorry. You're, you've and, got to stop. And they have to because the, the time cutoffs just right, need to right. be respected. And I didn't know if it was 5 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. And I was pretty sure it was 5.30, which I was going to be in time for, but it wasn't positive. And these two gentlemen came running out of the trees, just blew past me. And they're like, we're not going to make it. And I thought, well, no, what time is it? You don't it? need you know, to hear that. You know? And, and, and they, they tore off down the hill, and I said to my pacer, oh, I'm really sorry, I gotta go. <laughs> and I just threw myself down the hill, and I came screaming into the aid station. Well, I mean, I thought I was, I was probably moving very slowly, but uh, the gentleman with the clipboard at the end of the station, I said, did I make it, did I make it? He goes, oh yeah, you made it, let's go. And I said, all right, and I just took off out of there, and it was, they say when you start Leadville, you start as one person, and when you finish, you're another. And that is the truest thing I've ever heard in running. So did your husband recognize you that night? He did. He, that poor guy, he has a lot of trouble at altitude. So then you have to deal with, you know, getting a car back and, you know, somebody that just ran 100 miles. And uh, we got back to our friend's house and he fell asleep sitting up because he'd been up for 35 hours. And he just, he was asleep, but he was like, just on the sofa, just sound asleep and people were talking to him i was like just leave him like tip him over and, let and him it's sleep it's tough to be a crew you know, <laughs> yeah crew it is oh Absolutely. my gosh i think you've done more than I've one i've done six i finished six, six 100 mile races so which one was the other your best time oh that would be ghost train two years ago 21 hours and seven minutes great so now you got a belt buckle for that one right oh i i have uh well i have buckles for all of them, actually, because it depends on, like, Leadville, it's the little buckle or the big buckle. Oh, I see. Um, but the 2107 earned me um, top 100 in the world at the 100-mile distance. Wow, and how long ago was that? Mm, that was 2014. And this year I came close, 2147 at the same race, uh -huh. but the fields have gotten faster, so I ended up at 102. So I have some I have some work cut out for me this year at the Vermont 100. Okay. Whew. It's hard to keep up with you, Mary. <laughs> We introduced you as the co-leader of the November Project, mm -hmm. the New York City Tribe. Correct. And also you're the co-founder of this wonderful, it's a movement now, mm -hmm. Run for All Women. Correct. So which one do you want to tackle first? Well, I would say that um, both of them are equally important, but with really, really different scopes. Um, November Project has, I, I've been very fortunate to be asked by the New York City founders of the New York City Tribe, uh, John Honerkamp and Paul Leake, to with my um, compatriots, Jeannie Tonelli, Ro um, Rob McCombs, and Jason Cooley to take over November Project New York City. We officially took over on March 8th, which was crazy because it was also International Women's Day. So all my Run for All Women folks came and we had about 320 people at the workout. And it was a big surprise. We, you know, we didn't tell anybody who was gonna be leading and then we just were leading. And it's amazing to look at what John and Paul have built and then to say, okay, well, what could we do now? Like, and to have three times a week, 150, 200 people standing there going, okay, what do we do next, coach? Now, this is like at 6.30 or 5.30 in the morning. At 5.28 in the morning or 6.28 in the morning on Wednesdays. And then on Mondays and Fridays, we meet at 6.28 in the morning. Okay. There's one standard spot. You always be Carl Schultz. Carl Schultz Park on Wednesdays. Um, Mondays, we do the bridges, uh, either the Manhattan or the Williamsburg Bridge okay. for some hill practice. And then Fridays are my favorite days. Fridays, we do Destination Deck. So tomorrow, Tomorrow we're actually traveling out to Cobble Hill Park in Brooklyn, and it's been an amazing way to see the city. We've been to all of the boroughs, including Staten Island, and we're looking forward to, We've I think we even did a New Jersey workout in Hoboken. Excellent. And one of the unique things about the November Project, there are no fees. I think you'll model Free fitness. 
Just show up. Just show up, exactly. Well, I did 100 to 150 people show up at times. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, except, except every, every one, workout, typically. Except for that one exception with Yellow with 300. Yeah, and, and we're not even the biggest tribe. Boston will typically get 300 at a workout. L.A., San Francisco will get 200 to 300. We, we want to get up there and compete with them. We're right. in 33 cities right now. To get 150 New Yorkers to come at 5.30 in the morning or 6.30 in the morning is, is amazing. Oh, it's a lot of fun. We like to uh, we like to say it's uh, it's sweaty hugs for everybody. Uh, so the positivity, I think, is you know the workouts are what get people to come, but the positivity is what gets people to keep coming well, back. I, we had the great Meg Novato sitting mm -hmm. here, and uh, you know she made it sound like she was the star of the team. I said, wow, the Rebel Project just sounds wonderful. We we have a lot of fun, and we have amazing people like Meg and Pete Novato. We have folks that are you know serious serious athletes like our from our San Fran tribe, um, Patty O'Leary who's an internationally ranked ultra runner, but we have really, really terrific people um, from all walks of life that come running, walking, and we take everybody. Excellent. Run for all women. Sure. I think it started in, in support of Planned Parenthood, but I think it's going to take off. So tell it's us what's grow. the genesis mm -hmm. of it. Absolutely. So Allison Desir is a very dear friend of mine, I believe you know. Uh, was feeling kind of despondent right after the election, and it came to a head right after Christmas, and she thought, oh, I just, I'm so frustrated, you know, the, inco the incoming administration's not going to be kind to all kinds of groups, especially women's issues, and how do, how do I do something about this? So the idea that she hatched was to run from Harlem to Washington, D.C. on the eve of the Women's March. And she came to me with this idea, and she said, what do you think? I said, I think it's 240 miles. How are you going to do this? And she went, well, that's a lot of miles. I said, how many people do you have? And she said, there's four of us. I said, that's 85 miles a piece. You know that, right? And she went, I think we need a new plan. So we sat down over uh, a big pot of coffee and we hashed it out and we figured out how to make it a relay, uh, four miles a piece. And it was originally called Four Women Run for All Women, uh, that people could join at any point in time and run four miles because four miles can be accomplished by a lot of folks. And uh, we launched in the first week of January online with GoFundMe. Um, picked up a lot of steam, picked up a lot of press. Uh, by the time we left on the journey on January 19th, we had raised $70,000. Actually, it was $69,234, $69, but we wanted to write 70 on the check, but we didn't want to lie because we wanted people to keep donating. We had passed our original goal of $44,000, which was amazing. And then in 24 hours, we raised an additional $30,000. Wow, so you crossed over 100. Yeah, we raised just about $104,000 for Planned Parenthood. And, and it was the adventure of a lifetime running from New York City to Washington, D.C. If folks want, they can check us out at runforallwomen.com. We have a, a little, little video snippet of what we did. Uh, we have some information about our brand ambassadors because now we're looking to grow and we're going to bring all our brand ambassadors in next month for a women's summit in New York City. And later this year, we're going to launch a satellite run for all women events across the country. Wow. But that first... First one is very, very special, the inaugural. Now, there isn't a trail from Harlem to Washington, D.C. Nope. So how did you figure out we, the, the we, route? We route mapped it. So we used a lot of mapping programs that cyclists would typically use. And then we realized that there are limitations with every mapping program that you're just not going to get around. I, I, I remember standing in Trenton, New Jersey, on one side of an Acela uh, railway corridor waiting and hoping that the path that we had chosen was going to bring Allison and one of the women up over the hill. And it was just, I was so nervous for like 30 minutes that I called her. I was like, are you coming? She's like, there's train tracks. I said, I know, just keep coming. The 405 already went through. And she was, okay. <laughs> and she, we got her over the hill and we kept on. Um, but the crazy thing was people joined us. People showed up in the middle of the night. People showed up in droves in the cities. We had the most amazing welcome in Philadelphia and in Baltimore. Hundreds and hundreds of people joined us. We had over a thousand people join us at some point along the route. And it, it just, the, the, the sound and the fury of that. And then on the morning, arrive, we arrived two hours ahead of time at the Capitol. Wow. Um, and there was hardly anyone around because the you know, uh, march wasn't for hours and the inauguration was long over. So to make it to the steps of the Capitol and just have it be daybreak with nobody else around except this little group of 30 people and um, the Secret Service personnel that were really wondering what we were doing was, was quite, <laughs> quite an experience. Um, it, it's just, it's the most unbelievable thing. I was awake for 40 hours 
and and you you can do so much more than you think you can especially when you got all that motivation you know there's somebody else waiting so i guess you had a van follow you when you did we the four did miles yeah we had yeah we had a van and uh, one of the safety protocols that we decided upon early was that there should be two people on the road at minimum at any point in time nobody Excellent runs idea. alone and then at night the van followed very very closely behind us which was great because a lot of the route took us on um, shoulders of uh, fairly busy roads and I had just finished running 85 miles, and I have a lot of friends in the Philly running community, and they were so supportive, and they were wonderful. And my dear friend Rebecca Barber was standing there, and she was going, come on, I'll just, I'll take you down the hill, we'll go to my house, we'll, we'll, we'll get you a shower, and we'll get you back to the van. Okay, great, so got all situated, get back to the van, and everybody's asleep. But there's a group waiting outside, they're waiting to run. And I talked to our navigator, Amir, and I said, how you doing? And he goes, I'm dying, Mayor. can you navigate? I said, Oh, okay, let's see what we can do. And I walked out of the van and a friend of mine was coming around the corner with coffee. And I said, yep, yeah, I'll take that. Let's go. You're leading the group. I'm going to call the shots from the car. <laughs> you know, Mary, as we wrap up, there's a common theme throughout your story here. Every time somebody said something to you, can you, you the first words out of your mouth, let's go. Most people would go, uh, can I get back to you? <laughs> but you're Let's go, let's do it. So where did this non-fear or this, this, this commitment of just doing it, did that come from your parents, your childhood? I, that's a great question. I, um, I'm not, I was always a little bit hesitant as a kid and um, I enjoyed a lot of arts and theater, but I was always sort of the awkwardly big and sort of you know, slightly uncomfortable in my own skin child. And uh, somewhere about halfway through my high school senior year, my father got very sick and he died uh, a Sorry. week after, thank you. He died a week after my high school graduation. And I was really adrift for a long time. And then I thought, you know what? I only have one shot at this. Let's do it, let's go. Great, so you're doing it to honor your father. In, in a lot of ways, yeah. I think there's definitely some things that he, he'd probably go, please don't climb up that mountain. Please don't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he's, you know, smiling at you at heaven, obviously. Well, I, I, I'd like to think so. But ultimately, it was about, you know what? You're, getting, you're going this way once. Go all the way. Go all in. Great. Go all in. Any final thoughts? I would just like to tell everybody who thinks that they can't run or that they don't want to run or that they, they could never do it, you are stronger than you think you are, and you can do more than you think you can. And it's, it's about just starting. Don't worry about the finish, just start. start. On that note, thank you so much for coming in, Mary. Thank you, Will. I really appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure. Mm -hmm.